The conscious business is constantly thinking about its responsibility, especially to its people, its community, and its continuity. It certainly doesn't regard its people as disposable, and it knows it has a responsibility to provide the resources and the facilities to bring on and grow new talent. I like on The Conscious Business Show to chat with people who have the right vision for the future, especially with career growth for young people. And today, I have a gem for you. He's the head of the Talent Academy at CloudStratix and is passionate about supporting young people into the IT sector. So let's meet Fred Flack. Welcome, Fred. Hi, Malcolm. Pleased to be here. And good to talk to you. Fred, tell us about the Talent Academy, what it does, and who it does it for. Right. Okay. So the Talent Academy itself, I guess, has three main customers. Um, we've got the customers, which are the individuals that we actually bring into the Talent Academy, who um, are generally university graduates, people out of college, people out of school, um, or individuals that have been in job for a relatively short amount of time and want to uh, move into the IT, the technical in, uh, industry. Um, we've got the customers that are the practice leads, so those other leaders within our business that need individuals to work for them and, and, and uh, deliver projects for our clients. And then the final customer is, is our clients. So those individuals um, that come to us for services, for thought leadership, for um, execution activities, whatever it might be, um, they also are sort of our customers as a talent academy. So what does it do? Um, I guess the first thing it does is try to recruit individuals that have what it takes to succeed. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that if you want. I mean, I think the thing for us with recruitment is that we've gone for a, a very different approach. Um, a lot of organizations, they look for very specific degrees. They look for um, very specific grades, maybe, you know, even, even down to the schools and the universities that people have been to. Whereas um, we try to recruit people based on genuine um, capability to uh, problem solve, to communicate, um, and to to sort of, and, and I hate the term self-starter, but actually to get up on their own, think on their feet and be able to make stuff happen without necessarily needing, um, you know, too much support around that and the guidelines. Um, so that's one part. Once people come into the organization, um, it's really about giving them the ability to get frontline and work with clients as quickly as possible. And we give them the training and everything that they need for that. Um, and, uh, and, and, and additionally, it's about um, helping them be part of something to expand and grow the Tunnel Academy itself so that they get real world experience of what it's like to develop and grow elements of a business while they're also working with customers and getting the experience out there. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's what it does from an internal point of view. From an external point of view, it provides individuals, it provides talent um, to, to our clients. Um, and, uh, and so far, <laughs> fingers crossed, we've had, we've had a, a, a pretty good record of, of providing good people and, and, uh, and people that have been able to make a difference. Brilliant. I, I, really, I really like the initiative. But let me ask you, what do you in your mind is the purpose or the old word mission of the Talent Academy? And how do you know when you're achieving that purpose? Yeah, so the mission when we first started was to, buy, to find the next generation of leaders. Um, mm. And, you know, I, there, there will be all sorts of ways in which we can me uh, measure that in the long run. Um, in the short run, I think the culture appreciates that that's what we're trying to do. And I'm really glad that, you know, when we asked the, the Talent Academy, the people within it, to come up with what we should call them so that we're not referring to them as grads because they might not all be grads. We're not referring to them as, you know, new joiners because, you know, they might maybe come into the talent academy from somewhere else. Um, they, they opted to call themselves the Gen L's because they were the next generation. You know, they, they really feel like that's what we're trying to do for them. Yeah. So I think on one measure, you know, in the short term, well, at least we've got a culture that people feel like we're trying to do that. In the long run, really, um, the thing that will tell us whether or not we succeeded, whether or not these are individuals that take very senior leadership posts in, um, you know, in big organizations or indeed their own organization. Um, so 
in the long run, we'll have a better view. In the short run, I think we've got some uh, insight that hopefully it is it is working in, in, in that mm. way. Um, it's a very clever concept by Cloud Stratix. In a few years, you'll have alumni all over the world and different customers. Mm, clever. I like the concept, but tell me how you embed a strong culture of diversity and inclusion in who you find and who you develop. Yeah, so diversity is an interesting one, especially in the IT industry, because historically, the IT industry hasn't been hugely diverse. Um, and what that means is that there's almost a generational gap between a more diverse pool of, of, of talent that are, is interested in IT now versus the pool of talent that has been working in IT for, for a longer period of time. So I think it's easier for me in the Talent Academy to, to have a diverse work, workforce um, than in perhaps it is in, in, in other areas of IT. Um, we've mentioned recruitment. I don't personally feel like I go out to recruit a um, socially diverse set of individuals. But what I do is I, I recruit based only on what I think we need, you know, at the time. And, and what that does is, is, is mean that actually at one point in time, we need a you know, certain specific set of skills, a pe person that's got an attitude that's in a certain way. And in another time, you know, whether it's different client requirements or just because actually to make the team work better, we need someone with a slightly different set of, of, of skills or, or, or values. Um, then we, we, we recruit someone else. So we've ended up with quite a diverse, I, mean, I guess, socially diverse workforce within the Talent Academy. Obviously, could be more diverse. Um, but, but not through sort of positive discrimination or anything, just through, you know, discrimination based on the attitudes that, that, that we want. Um, and, and it's worked out quite well for us. I mean, I think at the moment we're probably the most diverse sort of pool of talent in our business. Um, and I, and I hope, you know, that when I look across other areas and other, um, uh, other competitors of ours that we're, that we're that we're leading the way there as well through um, through the mechanism that we have to bring people in. Um, I mm. think another reason that we are able to do that, though, is because, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier, we don't need to focus on specific degrees and courses because even now, a lot of engineering courses are predominantly done, you know, by males. Um, but I think we offer slightly different sorts of roles and different routes in to technology than you would um, than you would otherwise find in other organizations. So in a lot of organizations, people go in and they are expected to code for the first, you know, two, three, four, five, however many years. And if they're good at that, then they might move into the next step. Or they might be expected to be a project manager. Or they might, you know, but it's very specific. What we offer is a slightly broader, you know, a, a broader experience. And that therefore attracts a broader set of people in the first mm -hmm. place. Um, and when we're talking to people about the sorts of roles that they want to do, it's more likely that, that it falls in line with what we need if they are looking for a broader and, and more well-rounded um, opportunity, as opposed to the technology organizations that we know, and especially the big ones that bring on people to do something very specific and work in a very specific area. And that's a little bit of an advantage of being a smaller business as well. Okay. Yeah. Now, I want you to imagine that um, the CEO, MD, uh, he or she is watching this and thinking, hmm, my son or my daughter is now moving on and they've come through college and they want to get into IT. Where do you see the immediate career opportunities for young people? Is it, as you say, coding, sales, uh, DevOps, customer service, where? So I think... Personal view is that IT is so pervasive in almost all industries at the moment that it is um, foolish to designate specific areas within IT that are going to be the right place for people to go. Mm. Um, I, would, I would probably argue that in order to understand the best place to be, we need to understand where technology most closely aligns with 
the business to provide a value add service to businesses. Now, if you are a software company, then there are roles in sales that align to the businesses that they sell to. There are roles within um, uh, business relationship management, and there are roles with product ownership where an, where an individual actually owns the product and chooses what upgrades get done, what improvements are made and so forth. And, and, and again, work with the business to, to figure out what the priority should be. I, I always think that the closer that you can get to the value adding services, the better. Um, Therefore, you know, things like coding, yep, incredibly valuable, but they will often be one or two um, areas removed from the part of the business that's actually, you know, driving revenue. So I would always think, look, get to the place that you're going to be working with the business and touching on IT. The further we go into the future, I can't see IT being any more disintegrated with the business. If anything, it needs to go the other way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, coders in time will become just as important as, um, as anything else. So I, you know, I don't think there's a wrong answer to that. I think if you're going to work within technology, you're going to find sooner rather than later that actually what you're doing is an integral part of whatever business you're working for um, mm -hmm. and only going to become more so. Excellent. Yeah. Now, I want you to put technical skills aside. What makes a good and effective IT worker, someone that you think will go far? Without giving away too much of our uh, <laughs> yes. recruitment uh, requirements. I, look, I, I really like individuals that are able to clearly articulate, you know, whatever it is that they're talking about. I like individuals that are able to look at a problem and break it down to its component parts and try and understand one, two, three different ways of, of solving the same thing um, and be able to articulate that. Um, and I think individuals need to be naturally inquisitive because even if you're, and I'm not technical, even if you're not technical like me, um, you still need to need to want to know what's going on and need to want to understand why things happen in technology in order to have any chance of succeeding. So if you're able to problem solve, if you're able to be inquisitive, mm -hmm. if you're able to communicate with people, those are the three main things that, um, that I look for. Um, yeah, I got you now there. Now, one of the challenges of young people is in developing the social skills that they don't get at school, college, even uni. And, and especially at the moment with so much uh, remote working, if they are to progress though, they need to learn to communicate with confidence. How do you help them overcome such a challenge? Yeah, communication is, is not an easy thing to change for people. Um, now, there are a set of mechanisms that we do put in place for you know, our newest recruits that don't have experience communicating, certainly in a corporate environment. Um, and they vary from um, making sure that they have the opportunity in the platform to present, and, you know, and I mean, a good example of that, you know, every Wednesday we have a Talent Academy led presentation to the whole business. And that, will, that won't always be the Talent Academy that's, that's presenting, but we do try and make sure that the individuals within the Talent Academy have a slot at some point so that we can get them ready, help them prepare for that presentation, um, give them some tips and advice um, on how they can present, how they can feel confident while they're presenting, and then give them some feedback afterwards. And what we find is that giving people the opportunity to do things like that, they do soon warm to ways in which to communicate to multiple people. The, the more personal forms of communication, like uh, working with clients, working with customers, um, and even working with more senior stakeholders within our, our business um, or indeed, you know, peer level or, 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 even, uh, or even below in the sort of hierarchy comes more from, I think, regular um, sort of mentoring and management sessions. Um, you know, again, one of the benefits of being a smaller company is that we're very, it's very easy to see everything that's going on um, and how people are working with each other and who's communicating and who's not communicating. So it's very easy to say, look, you know, you're doing a great job. I'm not sure you're making enough of it. 
and telling enough people about it and then help people navigate the business with them as well. Um, so in part, it's about giving people the platform to sort of uh, to an audience. And in part, it's also about making sure that we're giving uh, people a platform with one to one with peers um, and with senior members of staff to just practice. Um, you know, I don't think there's a huge amount of formal training that's really going to teach anyone the best ways of communicating. Um, although I know you spoke to Roger, he has uh, a couple of yeah, good recommendations on how successful people think based on, I think the, 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 there's a book on it, the um, seven habits of successful people that Roger will refer to a lot. And actually, you know, the more I look at the way that we work and the way that we get um, our staff to work and our staff to communicate, there are, there are parallels with, uh, with things like that. So there are mechanisms that we, that we try and instill in people to, to help them communicate as well. Mm, excellent, Fred. And uh, Fred just mentioned uh, Roger um, Bennett, who was the who was the project director at Cloud Stratix. And you can see my interview with Roger on one of the other channels here on the BVTV network. And just before we move on, I, I'm, I expect viewers and listeners, you're equally as impressed as I am about this superb initiative. Don't forget to take down the URL that's on the screen behind me. Now, Rod. Fred, what three or four skills do you think are likely to impress a CTO who's seeking to fill some vacancies? It is, as you say, not all based on certifications, is it? Not certifications. Um, uh, apart from, I guess, the inquisitive natures, um, uh, problem-solving communication skills, like I've mentioned, the things that will often impress uh, a CTO would be the capability to distill uh, an individual's wants and needs. So what do I mean by that? Can you talk to someone that has no understanding of technology and figure out based on what you know in technology a means to solve their problem? Um, that I think is the number of what a CTO will be looking for and wants and needs. And then can we work out um, how we pull together a project or program in order to make that 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 idea a reality. So it's not about certifications at all. I, you know, certifications are important up to a point. I would um, I would take someone that that has that capability and ability over someone that has a computer science degree any day. Excellent. Yeah, I'm totally with you. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here now. Um, <laughs> I. IT companies are not known for good talent management or even providing the right career growth, in my mind. And I've interviewed 100 plus CEOs uh, on tech in the last uh, six months. They seem to ebb and flow with the economy, often fixated on using cheap overseas labor. How's the Talent Academy seeking to change this and why? Yeah, it's... Um... It's a, it's a completely different model. I mean, you're right. Historically, I think where IT has been more separated from the businesses that they support, um, it has been easier to outsource and offshore talent um, and consider it as a commodity service uh, as opposed to the direction that the markets and, and the economy looks like you know, it needs to go now, which is actually how do we try and provide as much value out of technology as we possibly can? Um, and in order to provide value out of te technology, you need to do, as you say, provide a career path for the individuals that are working in it so that they feel like they're respected, listened to, and actually they feel like they've got a, pr a platform to, to provide value rather than just provide a mediocre commodity service. Um, we're completely different. Uh, as it stands, we are um, we're based out of, of the UK, and, and all of our recruitment has been, you know, from people within the uh, uh, well to work in the UK, right? So um, we're not about offshoring talent. The price point that we can work at with our clients clients is not far off and offshore. Uh, you know, when we when we consider the blend that we're able to use um, with uh, with less experienced staff, but because we're using onshore staff, because we're using staff that we really care about developing, 
there is a path and an opportunity for them to actually, you know, stick their neck out and try and add value that they perhaps wouldn't uh, wouldn't be able to do if they were working in a in a, in a more commodity uh, commoditized environment. Um, so I think not only by doing it here with people that we recruit and care about, we are far more likely to deliver a better service to our clients. I also think that we're far more likely to deliver significant value within our business and, and outside of the business. And as a result, give people the opportunity to, to, to grow with that value. You know, the commodity service will only ever provide commodity for the mm-hmm. people that are working in it. Yeah. Um, and that's a flat, you know, flat rate of going. If we can find ways of producing real new value, then the people work up the ranks with that new value. Um, and I think, you know, inherently that's a completely different platform. Um, it motivates the people that work with us um, and, and it provides better solutions for our clients. Mm. I, I totally agree, totally agree with you. It's our experience that, you know, when you go for a commodity service, we'll say outsourced overseas, they do the job, yes, but totally blinkered. They don't think outside the box, and that doesn't add the value that you're talking about there. Exactly. But I like to give all my guests three wishes. If I were to give you three wishes for the IC, IT sector to change its thinking on homegrown talent, what would those three wishes be? Well, yeah, I was thinking three wishes. Um, mm. I no, think no, pa- first... no pantomime this year, Fred. No pantomime, so you can still have your three wishes, though. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of things we can't can't do this year. So uh, I think I think for me, I wish that there wasn't such a stigma around um, technology that it's uh, you know that's it's not very diverse and it's for nerds. Um, I don't. I, I think that now we're so far away from that being the truth that. Um, but I but I do think that it still scares good people away, and I think that technology is going to be a bedrock of, of economic growth for, for this country. And as a result, you know, we, we need to get rid of that stigma. I think, um, so that's number one. <laughs> number two, um, I wish that we weren't always fighting the mediocrity of big commodity offshores. I, you know, I, you know to, to me, as a business, it doesn't help the companies that we work with 90% of the time. And, and to my point earlier, I think that there's ways of adding value and delivering value um, that we should be more focused on. And I guess, you know, finally, the third wish would be, you know, completely, completely selfish. It would be a wish that, um, you know, people recognize the difference in what we're trying to do and what we're trying to achieve. And, um, and look, uh, look to work with us um, with the opportunity that we've got and with the great people that we've got um, so that we can, you know, we can help make those first two wishes happen. Um, mm. And I guess that's it. I wasn't sure if I'd have three, but there you go. <laughs> yes, you got three. Yeah. A good three as well. A very good three, Fred. Fred Flack of the of Cloud Stratix Talent Academy. I think it's a brilliant initiative and I really wish you all the well. Thanks for a brilliant interview. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Malcolm. It's been a pleasure.